Okay, for our uh, mid-afternoon section session today, again, if you haven't heard it yet from a Canisius person, let me say it now. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Canisius College. Thanks so much for, for coming. This is fantastic. Uh, now we have Sean Hooper from Ottawa, Canada, who's uh, presenting, and I'm going to hand it off to him. So he's Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, as I said, my name is Sean Hooper. I am here from Ottawa, Canada. This is my second WP campus, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here again. I am the director of IT at Actionable.co. Uh, we are a learning development technology startup um, with employees in five countries now, entirely distributed. So I have the, the pleasure of working from home, which I love. And uh, I've been a WordPress developer since 2011. And I am the co-organizer of WordCamp Ottawa, which is taking place next weekend. <laughs> Today we are going to talk about testing. Because we spent so much time building our websites, we need to make sure that they are working correctly. Now, usually when you come to a WordPress event and there's a testing talk, it's around unit testing. Unit testing is testing the smallest possible piece of code usually a PHP function or a class or same thing in JavaScript to make sure that it does exactly what you expect. Something like this, a function, I call it plus one that just adds one to a number. And a unit test would say, if we pass 10 into this function, we expect 11 to come back. If not, it fails. That's unit test. But that doesn't test that everything works well together once the site is launched. A unit test won't tell you that there's an error in your JavaScript console. It won't tell you that when you click on a button, nothing happened. Uh, and these are things that are really important to know. So we want to test how the web application works as if we're actually in a web browser clicking through the website. This is a form of integration testing or functional testing. The other thing testing UI will do is you want to test and see how does your website work at different resolutions. Is, are your responsive designs working the way you intended them to? Does your website work in multiple browsers? As a developer, I tend to work in Google Chrome all the time and don't want to get caught when someone says, hey, I just tried using the website in Firefox and it didn't work. Or I'm using IE8 and it didn't work. I'm not going to say IE6, that is now dead and gone, and I am happy for that. Or I'm using this website on my mobile device and it's not working properly. So cross-browser testing is important and that's something that UI test or that uh, unit testing would not take care of. Dynamic page testing. Uh, a lot of our pages these days change uh, based on Ajax calls and components moving around the page when you interact with it without actually reloading the page. You need to test that that stuff works properly as well. So this is all things that UI testing will take care of. The way of testing UI that I'm going to be showing you today is using a package called Selenium. There are other uh, packages that will do this kind of stuff. Uh, this is the one that I've chosen to work with. <laughs> and Selenium really just automates browsers. It is a headless uh, browser controller, uh, and it's perfect for doing these tests because we can write the tests and automate them. Um, one of the neat things about Selenium, though, is you could actually use it just to automate common tasks, if you had to, if you keep going to a website and doing the same things, you could really automate that with Selenium too. Selenium requires a server side and then a client library to call it. To install the Selenium server, which um, is a Java application, the easiest way to do it, uh, I'm on a Mac, is to use Homebrew. There is a formula for the Selenium server. So you just do brew install Selenium server standalone. Uh, you can also download the jar file and run it if you have Java running on your machine. And then you need the browser drivers. So these are the drivers that Selenium knows how to control that type of browser, be it Chrome or Firefox or Safari. Uh, for Chrome and Firefox, uh, there's brew packages as well, Chrome driver and Gecko driver. Uh, Safari is a little bit more complicated to install, uh, but there is a driver for it as well. For Internet Explorer, uh, you have to have a VM running 
uh, with IE running in it. So it's a bit more of a pain, and there's a solution to that, which I will show you later on in the talk. So after you have your server side running, you have your browser drivers running, you have to start them. And then you now have a listener running on port 4444 of localhost by default. If you go to this URL, it'll actually show you all the browser sessions that are running in the tester. So you can see what's active in what route, in what driver, so whether it's Chrome, whether it's Firefox, et cetera. This is also the URL that you will include in your code to say, call this URL with the test data. So this is the interface address as well. If you're running this, you will actually see, if you're running this, the standalone server locally, when you run your tests, you will see the browser open and it will open your web page and it will move around and click on the things that you've written in your test and you'll actually see it in real time on your screen. The only difference is, uh, at least in Chrome, there's a banner that pops up that says, this browser is being controlled by automated testing. So it's actually running in a special mode that recognizes that. Now, I said that there is a solution to the IE problem of getting it up and running, especially if you're not on a PC. And that's, let's offload the entire server component. There are services out there that run VMs and have a wide variety of browsers and devices available to do this kind of UI testing. Um, the one that I'm using is one called Sauce Labs. Uh, browser Stack also has one. I haven't used it, but I know they offer a, a similar service where they'll spin up the VMs and run all the Selenium tests. They're essentially running the server side on all these different machines. So the great thing about that is it gives you much more control over which platforms you're testing on. You can say, I want to test it on a PC or I want to test it on a Mac. I want to test it on Linux. I want you know, to test it on Chrome 42 because that's still what you know, one of our clients is using and you need to test on specifically that version. Uh, you're able to specify that. Um, with Sauce Labs, you can go onto their website and run manual tests. You can just open up a VM for that platform and that browser and manually run tests yourself, or you can use Selenium to automate it. Uh, through your dashboard, you can see all the tests that were run, and you can see screenshots of every step along the way of what the screen looked like in that stage of your test. It also includes a REST API so that you can put in additional information with your tests. Uh, for example, you might have a build version or a, uh, a branch that you're testing in from, your, from your Git repo, and you could put that information in alongside with the tests so that when you log into uh, the Sauce Labs dashboard, you could filter by which set of tests you were running. So some of the advantages of their system that I, I really like. Um, to do, uh, and then the only thing you have to change if you're doing this offloaded um, server side is change that URL. That local host address on port 4444 now changes to a URL with your username and access key at Sauce Labs' on demand server. Uh, and then you set up your capabilities. So in this case, I am running a test for Windows 7 on Chrome uh, version 58. So that's the VM that's going to get spun up and all the tests are going to be run against. And this is the dashboard that you end up getting after a test runs. Uh, you can see all the steps in the test on the left hand side and on the right hand side you see a video playback of what the browser window looked like at that step. And at the top of the screen, you can see the Windows logo with 7 and the Chrome logo with 58. So we know that it was Windows 7 and Chrome 58. Now, on the client side, we need something called WebDriver. WebDriver is the library that speaks to Selenium Server and that you will program with your tests. There are officially supported WebDriver uh, packages for Selenium that are written in Java in C Sharp, in Ruby, in Python, and in JavaScript or uh, specifically in Node. Uh, now, as a WordPress developer and mainly uh, a backend developer, I want to know what about PHP? Good thing, there's a, there's a small company out there, uh, their name is Facebook, 
uh, <laughs> who happen to use PHP themselves. So they wrote their own web driver library that interfaces with Selenium. So we're going to use the PHP web driver library for this demo. And you can add it to your project with Composer. I mean, Composer required Facebook slash web driver. And uh, for any of us who have done unit testing in WordPress, uh, a lot of the unit tests are done using PHP unit. And PHP unit works very well with Selenium as well. So let's use that as our framework for launching these Selenium tests. So we can also do a composer require PHP unit slash PHP unit to install that. We end up with a composer.json file that looks like this. And then we can go ahead and write our first test. So what I've done here is created a class. It's based on the PHP unit test case class. It's called homepage test. And what we're going to do is we're going to load a, a page and check and see what the if the title of the page in between the title tags contains a string that we expect to be there. So we're going to start up our web driver. In this case, we're using the, the uh, standalone version of the Selenium server on Chrome. Then we're going to call web driver with the get command and pass it a URL. So I'm going to open up the wpcampus.org website. And then with PHP unit, I'm going to do an assert contains that WebDriver get title contains the word WP campus. After that, I'm going to tell the browser to quit. So close the browser window and the test. There are several things suboptimal about the way this test is written, but it was a great way just to show you what a basic test looks like. We'll improve upon it as we go through. So if we run this, now we call PHP unit and it runs one test with one assertion and it passed. Perfect. If it failed, the first time I wrote this test, I wrote WP campus with a space between WP and campus and it did not meet what was on the website. So we can see there that it failed. It said failed asserting that WP campus con contains WP space campus. So that's what a failed test would look like. So, that made use of a couple of web driver commands, uh, the first three in this list. Get, which opens a web page, you pass it the URL. Get title, which queries what is the title tag of that web page. And quit, which closed the browser window. The other uh, most common uh, two commands you're going to call against web driver are find element and find elements. This allows you to query the page and find a piece of content on that page that you need to interact with. Find element will return the first instance. Find elements will give you an array of every instance matching your query. There are a pile of query mechanisms available that work with find element and find elements. We'll look at those after. Uh, some of the other things that are in WebDriver directly are switch to, which allows you to switch uh, open windows or frames in the browser. It also allows you to switch uh, focus to the element that has focus on the page. Um, so immediately find that element. Navigate allows you to move through the browser history. So this controls the browser's back button, forward button, uh, refresh the web page, or navigate to another URL. Uh, get page source returns the plain HTML for that page. Seems going to view source in the browser. And get current URL returns the current URL of the page. Uh, this is useful, uh, for example, you've done get on a page, you've gone and clicked on a link, it's now taking you somewhere else on the website, you want to test where you are now, get current URL would do that for you. Uh, you can interact with the mouse, so click functions, uh, click and hold, drag, things like that you can all do with the get mouse. Get keyboard, obviously interacting with the keyboard, pressing buttons. Get touch is touch screen interfaces. So tapping, swiping, uh, functions like that, the zooming in, that, those are all controllable with get touch. And then execute script and execute async script allow you to execute uh, arbitrary JavaScript code on the page that you have loaded. So it's the same as interacting with the JS console. 
Uh, so back to the find elements, as I said, this will return one or more elements matching a query. And there are multiple mechanisms available uh, to do a find element query. You can query by CSS selector. This tends to be the one I use. I'm very familiar with it because if you use jQuery, it's the same type of selector you use when you're writing uh, that lookup, that selector syntax. You can search directly by class name, by the ID attribute. If you are searching for anchors or links, you can use the link text uh, and partial link text selectors. You can look up by the name attribute. You can look up by the tag. So is it a div? Is it a nav element? Is it a h1? You could use tag name to look that up. Or you can do an XPath query as the last form of selector. So here's an example. I'm looking for uh, a array of uh, headshots off one of the websites that I run, and I'm using the CSS selector. So I'm going find elements with the web driver by CSS selector, and I'm putting in the query. I have, in this case, it's a div called the ACP consultants list. It has an unordered list in it, and I want all of the individual items in that list. And then I'm going to do a PHP unit assert that it is an array, and that it has at least one item in it. That's my test so that I know uh, this list is being loaded uh, by Ajax on the website. So this tells me that it's loaded in and that the headshots are visible. So that was my test I was running for it. Now, when you get an element or elements back from those find uh, queries, there's things then that you can do with that element that you can interact with. Uh, if you have an input area or a text area, using send keys will actually go into that field and start entering text. So you can fill out a form uh, pro programmatically uh, during your test. You can click on an element. Uh, so if you have a button or even an input box, anything, you can click on it, same as just having the mouse and hitting click. You can clear the area of those input boxes. You can retrieve the ID. You can retrieve any attribute value off that element, get the tag name, get the value of any CSS property. You can get the X, Y coordinate of that element on the page so that you can then interact with it uh, you know, using mouse or touch interactions. Uh, you can get the size, the height and width of the element. And uh, another very commonly used one is displayed. So find that element and then say, is it visible? Uh, this is really useful and we'll see an example of this in a minute using um, responsive design to go, well, depending on the screen size, the element's gonna be on the page, but maybe you can't see it yet. And we can check that. Uh, same with is enabled. If you have form elements, things like that, that are uh, disabled, you can check that. Uh, so this source here, I'm gonna do another little example, is uh, the form from WordPress's login screen. If you wanna log into your WordPress site, we can see that we have uh, the login field with the ID user login, user pass as a password field, and a wp-submit is the ID of the submit button to log in. So here we are using find element with the ID uh, mechanism for looking up user login, user pass, and user submit. And each one of those elements is then being stored as a variable. And I can now send keys to the username and password variables specifying my username and password that I want to use for this test. And then I can click on the login button. Uh, the other thing you can do uh, within the find elements is once you have an element, you can find its child elements using the same selectors, but it'll only search within that part of the DOM tree. So back to the test that we did earlier, uh, looking for uh, WP Campus in the title of the page. Um, we're going to uh, modify that a little bit, make this a bit more usable uh, and a little bit more abstracted. So I'm gonna create an abstract class that represents a page in uh, a WordPress site and has a couple of shortcuts for us. So here's that class. It's called Selenium WordPress Page Test. It defines the web driver 
and defines the base URL of the website that I'm going to test. It uses PHP units setup function to uh, specify the capabilities and launch the web driver. And it uses the teardown function to quit the browser. Uh, this way I don't have to write uh, web driver quit at the end of every test and I don't have to launch the web driver at the beginning of every test. It's taken care of by PHP unit. I've also added some handy functions, resize to mobile and resize to desktop. This is using the, uh, win the manage window uh, capabilities of Selenium to say resize the browser window. So resize to mobile, I made it 320 pixels wide by 1,000 pixels high. Resize to desktop, I made it 1,200 wide by 2,000 high. I know those were well within my breakpoints, so it allowed me to do my responsive testing. I've also taken that login code that I showed you and turned it into a function that's available in this abstract class. We will get the login page for WP admin. We will look up those elements, enter the username and password that are provided to this function, click the login button, and then we're going to use the Selenium wait command. We're gonna say wait five seconds, and every 250 milliseconds within that five seconds, check and see if the URL has changed to include wp-admin. If we get there within five seconds to wp-admin, we know we've logged into the site, otherwise something's gone wrong, and I'm just returning from this function a true or false that we can catch later. So the two things we've learned in this one that were new were the um, until command and the wait command, which allow us to wait for the browser to do something that might take more than instantly to happen. So now what I can do is I can write a test that extends the Selenium WordPress page test. Uh, we have two tests here. One is just does the page load? So I'm getting from the base URL the home page, and I'm asserting that the uh, the title contains home and a pipe after it. But what you don't see here anymore is configuring the web driver, quitting the browser, any of those configuration things, those are all in one spot in that abstracted class. The next test that this one does on my homepage is tests the hamburger menu. So I have a, a responsive website that when you collapse it down, the menu turns into that little hamburger icon. Uh, so what we're doing, we're loading the homepage, I'm resizing the browser to the desktop size. I'm then asserting false that my nav, navbar toggle uh, element by class is displayed. So I'm not expecting it here because I am on desktop. I then resize the browser to mobile size and I'm doing the same test again, but I'm asserting true because I expect the hamburger menu to be displayed. So if Everything responsive is working correctly at my specified breakpoints. Both of these tests will pass. And here's an example of just logging into WP admin. So I'm just test login and I'm calling this login, asserting it to be true. If for some reason the login failed, the test would fail. Uh, nice thing about the way that login function is written is that by default, it's using the username and password that I have in the abstract class. But if I wanted to test, for example, how my page looks if I log in as a subscriber or an editor instead of my admin account, I could pass those parameters in on this test and override the default credentials. So here's an example uh, that I'm using in the real world that does a whole pile of tests on a page to make sure it works. Uh, one of our sites has a revenue calculator on it that tells our potential partners, uh, here's what you could make by you know, using our services. So it looks like this. It's a simple little widget that has a couple of drop downs, and depending on what values you pick in these drop downs, it changes the numbers at the bottom of the screen. If you hit certain low values, we also pop up a little warning that says you might not be a right fit at this time. So it's a little error message with a link to a contact form. And this is all done based on 
This is just client side JavaScript running. It's not even making any Ajax calls. It's just logic in the JavaScript. But I want to test that all of this is working. So I wrote a Selenium test to do it using that uh, abstracted class. So I then created a function called test revenue calculator that loads the web page, checks that the title has the expected string, so I know we're on the right page, looks up for an element that has the class gem-revenue-calculator, and asserts that it is a, an instance of a remote web element when it comes up. So this tells me that the, the calculator is on that page. Um, the nice thing with that is if I had to disable, it's its own plugin. So if I had have turned off that plugin, there would have been a short code showing up there instead. So this tells me, nope, the, the, the plugin's running properly, the element is visible on the page. I'm then using the find element with the ID mechanism to look up each one of those uh, boxes that's on the page. Uh, and I'm looking for what is the current value. Uh, the new client select element, the employee select element, and the new meeting select element are the three select boxes I'm checking the values for. Uh, I'm getting the value of the um, of any of the drop downs, and then I'm checking the uh, the spans at the bottom that have the results to say do those have the default values I was expecting. Down at the very bottom of this screen, I'm using the web driver select class, which is a helper to deal with uh, select lists, the select tag in HTML, and I'm saying. Now, find that element and then go select the, uh, the, uh, the option that has a value of one, which is one of the options in that first drop down list. So it's going to find the option that has that as the value attribute and it's going to make it the selected element, or the selected option. And then I'm going to check and see was that you're not a fit warning that pops up at the bottom in red, is it visible? Because choosing one from that first drop down is what triggers that warning to show up. And then I'm changing that value again to 10 and making sure that that element has again disappeared. That warning shouldn't be there anymore. And then I change a couple of other form values to some higher numbers and I check that bottom row to see if those numbers have changed to what I expected them to be based on the values that were picked. So running this whole test has just gone through a whole pile of possible sequences using the revenue calculator and I know that it's doing exactly what we intended it to do. Uh, you can also use uh, Selenium to interact with the standard alert dialog the JavaScript can throw. So in this case, I am uh, opening a page. I am checking using uh, the wait until, again, that we looked at earlier. This one is looking for an expected condition. And the expected condition is that an alert is present. And this will uh, either after the timeout period let me know that there was no alert, or I will uh, add to the assert count, yep, the alert was there, the test passed. Uh, in this case, so the first test I'm doing is that it is not there. I'm then using execute script, which we talked about earlier. This uh, executes uh, JavaScript like you're typing it into the console. So I'm throwing an alert that just says hi. And then I'm checking again to see if that alert is there. Again, using the web driver expected condition of alert is present. You can also use expected condition to check for things like our elements appearing on the page, things like you can wait for things to happen and use the wait command. Uh, it'll just sit there until you either time out or until your condition is met. Uh, so the great thing about this is uh, you can integrate your Selenium tests with PHP and everything into your into your build scripts and your deployment processes. Whether you're using uh, Jenkins, whether you're using uh, Circle CI, which we're using, whether you use Bitbucket pipelines, you can build all of this in now so that before your site goes to production, you know that all of your tests are passing not only at the unit test level, if you're using PHP unit or, uh, or in the JavaScript testing frameworks, but also that when you open this up in all of your different browsers, that your site is actually gonna perform and do exactly what it is that you intended to, to do. Um, and that is the functional piece of this testing so that um, you, know, you don't 
come up with many surprises after your site launches. And that is an introduction to uh, Selenium. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, so web scrapers are good if you're talking about something like um, uh, what's the one that I was saying? Essentially, that goes out to a list of URLs. Those are really good for finding your 404 errors, uh, for finding uh, links to redirects that maybe you want to go and update those in. Uh, yeah, that's a very specific purpose. It's not going to tell you that when that page loaded, that there was elements missing on the page, or that when you click on a button, nothing happens. A web scraper won't catch that. It will scan through and say, here's an inventory of all of your pages. Maybe here's ones that have, it'll catch 500 errors. Those are handy to catch. Uh, but it will miss some of those things. Um, one of the other things you can do with Selenium uh, that I like is you can check the, uh, the console for errors. So you might have a page that loads nicely. Uh, but uh, one of my pages, for example, we buy a font from a third party that we call through CSS uh, to load. And if our license runs out, that font doesn't load. And they actually throw an error in the JavaScript console when that font doesn't load properly. My Selenium tests, uh, I could have it when the page loads, check to make sure that there's nothing in the console. And if there is, throw an error. And that would catch that quicker than someone going, that font doesn't look quite right on that page. You know, so that's where some of this testing is better than a web scraper, but web scrapers do have a very specific and valid use case for inventorying and checking links. Uh, there's another type of testing uh, service um, that you can say, run these tests and then look for this image. It'll do like an image capture, look for a piece of the screen that looks like this. Handy for doing really quick tests for something one-off, something that you know isn't gonna last long, but those tools, will never survive your site going through a redesign, where as long as you keep you know, your class names and stuff similar, really handy if you're using like Bootstrap or common frameworks like that, Selenium will still work. Uh, those image screenshotting services will also not work with uh, responsive design necessarily. Your tests were written at a certain resolution. If elements rearrange, it's not gonna find them now uh, using those tests. So this really is programmatically using the DOM to be able to uh, run your tests. Yes? Since you're running actual browsers in the, uh, in the test space, mm -hmm. um, let's say you're checking for JavaScript events to fire, let's say you've got a navigation box that fires a JavaScript event. Yeah. Do you run that with the Selenium testing, or do you run a click event on the element and then let it run the script naturally behind it? Uh, I would click on the element, okay. because that's gonna make sure that the event listener that you have on that element is running properly. Awesome. So there's like a million things you could test on a big site, right? Absolutely. So how, do you have a process for sort of narrowing down like what is most important? How far do you go in terms of? So there's a couple ways I would look at that. Uh, first of all, what are the key business drivers on your website? What are the things that if they break, you're going to stop making money? Uh, test those ones first. You know, go through a shopping cart process. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're a higher ed institution, go through. A registration process. Go through your contact form. Uh, you know any of the, those key critical pieces that are you know are critical to business. The next one, because if you're doing this after the fact, this wasn't part of your development process in the first place. Uh, when you find errors, start writing your tests. When you fix the bug, write a test that validates that fix, and just start catching up that way. Um, ultimately, you're building tests along with the development right from day one, but uh, you know, as we all have many websites that we're going to need to play catch up on, you know, start key critical components and things that you caught bugs in that you now want to make sure are fixed. That's how I would go for it. Yes. I uh, It's caught things that human beings have missed. Uh, you know, we do throw things up on staging, you know, tell the team, you know, this is ready to go. You've, you know, got a couple of days to go play and it goes into production and someone else who wasn't on that testing team goes, uh, why is this not working properly? Where Selenium now will start catching some of those things uh, much faster. So it's a short, like, QI process? It's given me better sleep 
around our QA process. Uh, I, I know that the critical things are working. Uh, that the things that are going to break, yep, you might still have some problems, but it's not going to be those critical components. And if you wanted, you could even set up your test to run on a daily basis, have the entire test suite run, and just know that everything is still working, that nothing is broken because someone disabled a plugin or something like that. Right? If you're using something like Sauce Labs, where's your code? Do they have your? No. They do not have your code. If you're using something like Sauce Labs, I just realized I should have been repeating these for the live stream. Um, question is, if you're using Sauce Labs or one of these offloaded server sides, do they have the code for the tests? No, they don't. They are running essentially VMs. So your code is all sitting in your tests folder in your repo. The web driver is just instructing their server what to do, saying, go to this page, uh, you know, click on this button. So the most they have is the screenshots from your page uh, showing what's there. Um, the other thing, what was the thing that they have? If you're developing on an internal website that is not accessible on the internet, <laughs> and that was this gentleman's question, uh, Sauce Labs has, I think they call it Sauce Connect, which creates a tunnel uh, that you can open back into your environment so that it can access your internal servers. Um, I haven't tried it, but I imagine you can also do that with uh, NGROC or any of the other uh, the tunneling proxy services as well. Uh, I'm, I'm running our tests in our staging environment, which is open on the internet. Uh, and I can also open up the Sauce Labs IP range. If we had a firewall blocking staging, we could say let the Sauce Labs IPs through and their VMs then would be allowed to see the site. Uh, I noticed that you were, uh, when you were doing logins with, uh, with the passwords and stuff, everything was in there, you could that. Is there any yes. security issues with that? Uh, of course there is. <laughs> Plain text passwords are always a bad idea. Yes. Uh, and that's why this is not my production website and I was not showing you my production passwords. Um, now, in my case, I had to modify the way staging worked because my sites, I've used the uh, Google Apps login plugin and I've hidden the default WordPress login forms. So the only option you have for getting into my WP admin is using your Google credentials. In staging, I have to disable that plugin before I run the test mm. so that there is a password loginable way of doing it. Uh, I haven't tried it. I probably could write it so that it would navigate the Google login form, enter my password and all of that. But then you'd have to factor in, is it going to pop up with the uh, any verification screens or you know, what if I had multiple accounts open, things like that. So I've just decided to go the easy route and use the WordPress login. I will I'll probably end up updating that to navigate through the Google login process. Uh, the only problem with that being that I only know my Google password. I don't have credentials for the other user levels in Google. So, uh, but yeah, so yeah, don't use your production passwords in these tests because not only, you know, are you then transmitting that to Sauce Labs and it's in screenshots and all this kind of stuff, uh, potentially, but it's also then in your code repo. It's in those classes that are gonna say you wouldn't want it there. Uh, in terms of the other thing I didn't ramp, in terms of testing multiple browsers, so you want to run your tests in you know every different browser that you support. Uh, you would, uh, with a lot of the code, you'd have to write these tests separate times to do all those browsers. What you want to do if you're doing multiple browser testing is look at some frameworks that support uh, multiple browsers, uh, parallel testing uh, frameworks. I think Steward is one of them that does it, uh, and Sauce Labs has their own one as well. Uh, the other way to do it is to load in those browser capabilities, so the browser version, platform, and browser name from environment variables. So when you run your, your build script, it just runs the same test and just changes those variables before it launches the test. And that way you've got one set of tests that's usable, usable across multiple browsers. Thank you very much, and I hope this testing uh, makes your websites uh, better and your sleep better. Yeah. <laughs>